In the news now, there's an article that might bring hope to some of the performing artists out there, specifically singers. And this is in Health 24. And the headline reads, Coronavirus spread. Singing is no riskier than talking, scientists find. Now, I like it when scientists actually go up and make a mock-up situation of reality and actually try and work with evidence. And this is something I can certainly support. It says, it however depends on how loud a person is singing according to a new study. Now, if you actually read through the article, and I'll, as usual, put the link in the description underneath this video, then you will see that it looks like people can go out and sing and that, that it's not going to cause much of a problem and that this article and the scientists suggest that uh, you could actually have shows with people in the shows, etc. There might obviously be a catch there, but let's go through the article now. Singing doesn't produce more respiratory droplets and aerosols than talking. This is according to a new study which adds that it depends on how loud the singing is, which is obvious. The louder you sing, the more air is moving through your mouth and it's just mechanical energy of air movement that can spread anything from your mouth, uh, little droplets and so on. These findings may have implications for live indoor performances. Now, if they're concerned about indoor performances, why the boohoo about outdoor performances? Why can't we have outdoor performances then? But we'll get to those details just now. Earlier research has shown that breathing and talking and coughing release tiny aerosolized particles carrying the SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. So immediately I like the fact that this is scientifically accurate because they are saying here that it's a SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes the COVID-19 disease and that it's a virus that spreads, the disease cannot spread. In a new study, surprising findings reveal that singing is no more likely to spread infected aerosols and respiratory droplets than speaking at a similar volume. The research, which has been supported by Public Health England and the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, was carried out by a collaborative team of 13 researchers from Imperial College London, the University of Bristol and Royal Brompton Hospital. The results of the project called PERFORM is the first of their kind and have been published on preprint server ChemRxIV. It has not yet been peer-reviewed and published in a scientific journal. So when a study like this is performed, it has to be peer-reviewed and only once it's been peer-reviewed, it can be published in a scientific journal and can be seen as scientific, scientifically sound. And this is why many of the things around the, the COVID-19 pandemic has been unscientific because there has been no peer reviews performed with many of the actions that have been taken. So I'm glad to start seeing things like this happening months down the road, which is obviously way too late. Measuring the spread. To measure the amount of aerosols and droplets expelled by a group of 25 professional performers, an orthopedic operating theater, an environment of zero aerosol background was used. Now this is what you have to do to get a proper scientific finding. You need to have a clean environment. This allowed researchers to correctly quantify the aerosol and droplets without confusing them with large numbers of ambient particles in the environment. The performers completed several exercises including speaking, breathing, singing and coughing. So they worked through the whole range of different uh, ways of actually releasing air from your mouth and obviously looking at the particulates that would emanate from that. Part of the test included the same participants singing and speaking the words to happy birthday between the decibel ranges of 50 to 60, 70 to 80 and 90 to 100, which is practically screaming. When the aerosol mass was measured, the research team found that there was a steep rise that came with an increase in the volume of the singing and speaking. But it was for, for speaking and singing. So according to the author, singing does not however produce substantially more aerosols than speaking at a similar volume. So either they're going to allow singing now or they're going to stop us from speaking altogether. This should be interesting. 
More than this, no significant differences in aerosol production were found between genders, as well as different genres such as opera, jazz, gospel and pop. Now, this is obviously interest, uh, important. Can you imagine they are actually still speaking about gender here and I'm really glad that they would make that distinction because some people in the world think that it's a societal construct. Let's continue. The next heading says, do finding support reopening of live musical performances? And this is obviously the very important point that most artists would want to come to. And then you need to convince a government with people that are unqualified to actually believe scientific findings after this has been peer reviewed. So let's continue. Based on their findings, the researchers believe that this could help allow live musical performances to resume during the pandemic. Musical organizations could consider treating speaking and singing equally, they said, with more attention focused on the following. The volume at which the vocalist vocalization occurs, the number of participants, the source strength, in other words, if it's a huge choir, obviously you'll have more source strength. The type of room in which activity occurs, i.e. is the air exchange, what is the air exchange rate in the room? But if it's open air, how is that relevant? The duration of the rehearsal and period over which performers are vocalizing. So it's basically time, distance and shielding. That's always the case. How long are you doing something? Okay, are you confined to an area and for how long are you doing something? Our research has provided a rigorous scientific basis for COVID-19 recommendations for arts venues to operate safely for both the performers and audience by ensuring that spaces are appropriately ventilated to reduce the risk of airborne transmission, said Jonathan Reed, director of ESPRC Center for Doctoral Training in Aerosol Science and professor of physical chemistry in the School of Chemistry at the University of Bristol and the study co-author. Declan Costello, a consultant, ear, nose and throat surgeon specializing in voice disorders at Wexham Park Hospital and co-author of the paper also commented and I quote, this research will give useful information to performers, venues and arts organizations about how they can reintroduce singing performances. Now to most artists, this is a very sore point. Many of you aren't allowed to perform at this stage. You, you're not allowed to perform in a way that is open and free. And in many cases, there's just no avenue for you to be able to get any form of income. Now, this is a step in the right direction. We should ask, why is this only happening now? Who will peer review this? Is there an interest, a political world to peer review this? Is there a political world to allow artists to start performing again? And will people, after all the fear mongering, actually go and listen to them? Will they be audiences listening and what conditions will a government now all of a sudden put on people going to this concert are we going to be forced to have a kovi pass or a kovi id or whatever it might be where we are marked and tracked to see if we get into close proximity of someone that's tested positive for the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus or will they just allow based on science for people to just carry on with their lives like they did before, still taking normal precautions. And I will keep you up to date with this development. Anything scientific like this that is fact-based interests me because I believe in facts. Facts make things simple. They make things relevant. And reality is better than any politician's mind. And science can make, make a big difference to the way we hope future politicians will think when they actually know how to interpret and consider facts when given to them by experts and not by the World Health Organization who are not an elected body but by scientists that have done a practical study that can be peer-reviewed because then it's not pseudoscience. I will keep you updated. Thanks for subscribing to this channel. Those of you who haven't subscribed, please click the subscribe button. Click the like button if you like the video. And please click the bell icon if you want to receive notifications for future videos. Thank you very much. Till the next video.